Why, hello there, and welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 393. That's tres nueve tres. How you guys doing? How you guys feeling? Great, amazing. Welcome back. Nice to have you. If it's your first time watching the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below with your thoughts and opinions. I'd love to get back to you and hear what you have to say regarding the show itself. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five star review, download the show, and share it with all your friends. And as always, support via Patreon is always more than welcome. You can click the link below in the show note description, as well as the pinned comment underneath this video contact me or go to patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o to sign up to patreon and be a member of the agostino zinger show via patreon where you get access to one exclusive patreon only show only available via patreon obviously as well as this show in audio format before it comes out anywhere else sometimes i get this audio or this video i chop up into clips upload on my youtube channel then i obviously get the audio extract that and upload into podcast services but that comes sometime after but if you want to hear it as soon as i finish definitely sign up onto patreon you can listen to the entire show at your heart's leisure via patreon only before it comes on any other platform especially sign up there it's only one dollar an equivalent of one pound wherever you're located nothing really to pay for it so make sure you sign up on there get involved back my beer consumption we're in the last week or so of october okay we're back in the show and um yeah man how's it going good good great 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 amazing my my life yeah pretty well same 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 old crap um you know how it is um Nothing's really changed that much. What have I been getting up to this weekend? Watched a bunch of films, watched Barbarians on Netflix. That's pretty cool. It's a cool little series about ancient, you know, in the ancient history genre. It kind of um, highlights a particular battle that took place that some people would um, characterize as the beginning of the end of the Roman Empire. They tried to invade or take over a part of Germania, which is what we kind of deem to be modern day Germany, Austria and other parts um they tried to essentially take over them because there were warring tribes there at the time and then of course the warring tribes came together to defeat this empire known as the roman empire and it kind of charts that entire course of that ordeal and battle and it's great because it's historically pretty bang on considering some of the documentaries i've watched and books that i've read documentary channels i'd recommend you check out for ancient history would be kings and generals invictus armchair historian the history guy there's quite a few people that i kind of follow online watch these documentaries late at night they're pretty cool to um get me out of my head and also allow me to think you know what as bad a situation it is now some of the lessons that we should be gleaming from the past should be applied to the things that we're going through in the present i would assume but that's been pretty cool um, there's another one called La Revolution, which is a um, French one, <clears throat> even though I'm saying it in a Spanish accent, don't forgive me. And what else did I watch this week? Oh, I finished the Larry Levine documentary on the Paradise Garage. I'll do a review of that later, but that was epic. You know, I'm a bit of a nighttime aficionado. Obviously, I DJ. Obviously, I used to put on events and I'm just obsessed with um, dance music in general. So watching that documentary and sort of getting an understanding of how important um the paradise garage was during that era of you know um sexual liberation and exploration of music and djing culture and nightlife scene and whatever you know especially outside of the studio 54 stuff because you get i'm not gonna say you get the whitewash history of dance music in america but you do get only a particular perspective from it and if you have watched the studio 54 documentary you'll know that yes it was an amazing spot but if you, when you get down to the real essence of it Studio 54 wasn't you know it wasn't anything more than just like a really well done private members club yes there were obviously some elements to it and of course the moment in time that it was launched and founded the people that passed through its hello or you know that were able to pass across its um uh notary uh velvet rope on the outside and the individuals involved in running it behind the scenes you know are essentially some of our most uh inspirational thought leading cultural you know creatives but when you get down to the real real essence of it it was just a private members club right done really really well and it only represents a certain uh, perspective of voice of dance music during that time and it's great to get another perspective of you know of it through the paradise garage and some of the people that frequented that spot um just a shame you know we lost larry levine at such a young age i think he died when he was like 38 or something right really really tragic um all things considered there was a lot more he had to give but again um the great thing about dance music the great thing about nightlife culture the great thing about culture always right the art that you create lives on 
you know, way beyond your years. So it's impacted me, right, in 2020. And I'd imagine it impact others too when they watch it. And you never know what that could then go on to lead. Um, that you, you never know what that could basically result in, right? That could result in me opening my own place, starting a label, doing a, putting it together a collection. It could inspire a recipe, whatever. The art, art lives on in it. That's the one thing about it. Art can be immortal in that regard. So um, that's definitely cool to see. But that's been about it, really, for the most part. Again, keeping my head down, training a bunch, reading a bunch, same old, same old. Well, in the last week or so of October, that's been pretty cool. Heading down the home straight, light at the end of the tunnel. Can't wait to, you know, wrap my lips around a uh, chilled little glass filled up with whiskey and, you know, no ice. Just going to chill the glass itself and pour the whiskey in there, you know, like some listening bar etiquette. That's going to be great. Again, um. Sober October is a weird one, right? Because the premise behind Sober October came about, you know, mostly, well, it got popularized to me via the Joe Rogan podcast and more importantly via um, Joe Rogan and his friends essentially staging a somewhat intervention with Burt Kreischer that he maybe drinks too much and he looks, you know, he does look incredibly unhealthy, especially for somebody that takes off their shirt when they're performing stand-up. <laughs> that, that is um, something that no one can really argue about. And it kind of evolved from an intervention into their friend into kind of an opportunity for those guys to maybe um, put aside or put a pause on their hedonistic life on the road, you know, being stand-up, professional stand-up comedians, touring the country, touring the world. There probably isn't an opportunity to be healthy. You know, you're probably encouraged, you're probably encouraged to um, choose the most unhealthiest of options. I know for me, that's what's happened in the past, especially when I was DJing every weekend and working Monday to Friday, Right. The last thing you want to do is look after your diet and watch how much you're drinking when you finally have a time to play, especially when you're trying to squeeze in. Because thinking about it now, right, it just seems nutty, isn't it? But now, of course, things have changed because the world has changed and we're all working from home. But having to go to the office every single day and then obviously work you know, to, to some level of proficiency and then obviously having to think about the set you want to play on the weekend, then on your lunch break preparing that set, then coming back home and preparing. Like I'd be that guy on my laptop you know, using tractor and record box, looking like a proper wanker, right? It, it comes across a bit wanky, but I had to do what I had to do. I'm preparing my track list. I'm synced up onto my hotspot, downloading some extra tunes if I need them, if I need them, buying some extra tunes, um, getting my playlist up and ready and, you know, extracting the things, exporting it, sorry, from my memory stick, going home, changing, getting my outfit sorted out, making sure I have all my adapters and my headphones and all that good stuff, right? Lip balm, all this weird stuff that you forget you probably need, especially when you're DJing in the DJ booth where there's an air conditioning unit right above you. Sometimes your lip end up getting extremely, extremely chapped. So um, you're doing all that stuff. And it kind of takes its toll on you, innit? And then when you get into the bar, the last thing you want to do is think about how much you're drinking. You're just going to keep ordering the drinks. You know, the bartenders are usually super nice when you're nice to them, especially if you're the DJ. Um, they tend to kind of um, welcome a new face that isn't one of their staff members that they know everything about. Because that's what I remember. That was what happened to me while I was working in retail. Especially when, you know, if, if a somewhat young person came into shop, um, and they were up for having the chat, you would just, you know, be laying it on them, talking to them like you're your day or best friend because you were so fed up of talking to your colleagues. So um, anybody that came into Dr. Martin's back in the day that had um, an expert customer service experience via me, um, it wasn't personal. I was really bored. <laughs> but yeah, um, so so October worked really well in that regard, right? Because I'd be working a bunch, DJing a bunch, um, and you just pushed the limit and you needed an opportunity to kind of press pause and allow yourself the chance to savor the taste of alcohol again right especially at work most of my startup gigs i've had uh, you know there, there was some element of thursday friday evening drinks where the office manager um, hr person would go out and buy a few bevies and you'd come you know gather around the table and gossip about managers you didn't like and stuff um, and obviously that kind of added to the drinking marathon and then you go into the weekend DJing and playing in bars where you're necessarily, you know, given tokens or an open tab, you know, it's just nutty and it can get, it can get really crazy really easily. So what started as an intervention for those guys turned into an aspect for me to kind of get my lifestyle into some sort of check. So it helps. But then again, over time, you start to realize that you're not really an addict, isn't it? in my respect, right? I, I have my drinking spurs. I have my going crazy um blocks but i'm not an addict in terms of like i can't function with this stuff and you know i get the shake so if i smell a bit of alcohol i'm start my, my 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 head starts dripping right i might make some silly mistakes you know getting um i might make some dodgy 
dodgy decisions, right? That's it, I'll say. Some questionable decisions when I'm under the influence. But in terms of it kind of really affecting my life in terms of negatively, right? And, you know, you know, kind of setting me off course, never it hasn't really happened to that regard. So it kind of has the relevance and the sort of opportunity to do it has maybe waned over the years. This year more so, especially during COVID, right? Um, I'm part of a little Discord where people are doing Sober October and it's, you know, it's been pretty empty. Like the chat's been so dead ever since um, Sober October started. I think there was a bit of chat in the first couple of weeks and people sort of died off and eventually people have just given up and just, you know, um, gone back to drinking because that's the only joy they've kind of been able to glean from these dark times. So it's been a hard one, to be honest, um, just simply because of that. You know, you kind of want to just let the hours sort of like rush by and there's nothing better than getting yourself absolutely blasted at home. But then again, it does get a bit depressing when you're just at home, just swigging, you know, copious amounts of alcohol, not knowing what time of day it is. It just gets a bit dark, in it? In my experience, that's for me. And personally, you know, having to read, watching movies, writing a bunch and doing work, is just not conducive to having, you know, alcohol on deck all the time. So that's been a good benefit. Um, also, I think I've kind of gone back to the idea of like not having alcohol in the home. I'd never really did have it prior, but obviously in the last year or so, there was a, a moment where I'd be buying, you know, boxes and stuff and a couple of bottles of wine, da da da. But I think having the ability to go out and buy a specific bottle if I want to drink it, cool. But having an actual bar at home, I'm not really a fan of. I think it just encourages or gives me the opportunity to take the easy option out when basically sometimes, you know, if I want to reach for a drink, maybe pulling out a book might be a better option or watching a documentary or reading up on something that I'm interested in during the week, blah, 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 whatever. Those options might be a little bit better than straight away heading off and grabbing, uh, you know, a, a new whiskey bottle, whatever it may be. So as much as I'm looking forward to ending sober October, I am quite thankful that it does come around this during this time of year just before Christmas to get opportunity to kind of have a break and of course it gives you a good chance to build up some better habits heading into a new year because you get imagine right if you do all of the um you know cringy sobriety month things you get to you basically have two months in a year kind of not really because it's next year but you basically have a sober October and a dry January so you get to go crazy November and December right you get to go nuts on New Year's Eve and then as soon as January hits you get to start again and you know and January is a short month too um, it goes by an absolute flash. So you get the opportunity again to sober up and get yourself back to some kind of even kill. But again, you know, what can we do? What can we do? I'm still hanging on in there, still doing my thing, still reading about it, still doing the stuff that I'm doing. If you're still hanging in there doing Sober October, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to know what your experience is like. But from what I've gleaned, most people have sort of given up. But if you're still out there, still hanging on, let me know. Okay. So we have a jam pack show for you today. Oh, nice coffee. You gotta love a good coffee in the morning. Um, jam packed show, loads of stuff to get into, loads of interesting topics I want to expound upon. So make sure you grab yourself a nice hearty drink, a little snack, whatever it is that gets you going or keeps you going. And let's dive on deep to the topics at hand. So, topic number one, we have some pretty encouraging news regarding a vaccine. Um, with COVID-19. Of course, I know this is rehashed content or rehashed information. I think this news article has been going, doing the rounds in various different um, guises over the last couple of weeks, but it's just encouraging to know that there is some light in the tunnel. Now, whether or not this vaccine comes about in a year, two years time, I could not give the scoobiest about, I could not give the simplest shit. I'm just thankful that there's a, there are people working for our best interest somewhat um, out there in the field of science trying to get a vaccine trying to get something that works in order for us to resume our lives in you know to some level of normality because you know I can't take this anymore you know I'm not sure about you guys but being cooped up at home not being able to go and do the things that I enjoy <clears throat> not being able to go to the places that I love and just essentially living a pretty closeted life isn't a life that I want I was always a bit of a hermit always a bit of a loner but this enforced lonerism isn't fun right it's like it's like um organized fun at work <clears throat> everyone likes talking to their colleagues everyone loves a free drink everyone loves a free meal but being forced to go to the thing in in the in underneath the guise of team building right it can get very very annoying and very frustrating i know it can it can be for myself but what i would give i would give my left nut to do a bit of team bonding at some crappy corny overly lit bowling alley somewhere what i would give to go to some 
really corny cottage somewhere and do some sort of cringy pastor parcel team building thing i would give my left earlobe for that shit right now because i'm missing being around strangers i'm missing the the boom 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 basing sounds of a club system i'm missing the sweat the confusion the copious amounts of urine splattered all over the floor of a nightclub i need that in my life sooner rather than later and hopefully this news is a good indication of it so from the guardian it says oxford covid vaccine works in all ages trials suggest it says the following in the article one of the world's leading covid19 experimental vaccine procedure produces an immune response in older adults as well as young which is great to hear um, raising hopes of protection for those most vulnerable to the coronavirus that caused social and economic chaos around the world. So I'm guessing they're announcing this because um, I'm assuming there was some sort of idea that they were going to what just like forget about um, our older uh, population and just say, hey, we're going to make a vaccine for people under 50. If you're over 50, you're fucked. That is mad. I think if that's okay, I'm not sure why they're mentioning it, but it's great to hear that this vaccine is going to apply to all. Article continues, neither Oxford University nor its commercial partner AstraZeneca would release the data from the early trials showing the positive effects which are being submitted to a peer-reviewed journal, but AstraZeneca confirmed the basic finding about the vaccine it's called AZ1222, <clears throat> which was shared at a closed academic meeting. The phase two trials have shown that people over the age of six, 56, sorry, some over 70, produce the same sort of antibody response as younger volunteers. Whether older people will be protected, as always, has been key question for the vaccines being developed, the body's natural immune system, and therefore its ability to fight any virus weakens with age, which is why the COVID date for it rises in older people. But what, if that's the case, were they thinking of just making a vaccine that only works for young people? That is insane if that's the case. I guess they have to pick the lesser of both evils, isn't it? What would you rather, save the majority of the population or only one segment of the population? Dark, but that's a question a lot of scientists are probably having to um, wrestle with over time. It continues here. The data also shows that fewer side effects refer to the scientists as re reaction genesisity. React reactogenicity, right, were reported in older volunteers, which is encouraging, although that can mean fewer of them reported issues, such as the score, sore arm. It's encouraging to see the um, immunogenicity responses were similar between older and younger adults and that re reaction reactogenicity was lower in older adults where the COVID-19 disease severity is higher. The results further build the body of evidence that the safety and immunogenicity of AZ1222 said an AstraZeneca spokeswoman. Um, uh, the vaccine that works is seen as a game changer in the battle against coronavirus, which has killed more than 1.15 million people, shut the swaths of the global economy and turned normal life upside down for billions of people. However, if you think the first vaccine will be fully positive, they may be instead reduced to severity of illnesses so that people avoid hospital and deaths are reduced. They may also not last so that boosters will be needed. AstraZeneca said that I hope the vaccine may be ready for limited use within the coming months. We anticipate an, F um, an FSC readouts from phase two first trials between now and the end of the year. And if approved within countries, doses of the potential vaccine could be available to use before the end of the year, said a spokesperson. Wow, good, encouraging to hear. However, experts outside the company, the UK Health, Se Health Secretary, Hamat Hanok, expect not to be available until 2021. Um, asked if people could receive a vaccine this year. Hanok told the BBC, I don't rule that out, but it's not my central expectation. Who would assume, again, what, what's, what's with this fanciful thinking? Who really thought they were going to get a vaccine this year? That's insane. By all accounts, even receiving a vaccine by the end of the year is um, really revolutionary, right? I think the quickest turnaround for a vaccine was somehow somewhere under the 10-year mark, right? Or something crazy like that. So for us to get a vaccine for a virus that no one knew existed prior to, um, you know, prior to its spread... It's quite crazy within two years. That's a really, really good turnaround or 18 months, whatever it may be. Um, it continues there. Hanok said the vaccine was not ready, but he was preparing logistics for a possible rollout, mostly in the first half of 2021. The AstraZeneca has um, committed to mass manufacturing as a capacity of 3 billion doses, which equates to enough for 1.5 billion people globally getting the two-dose vaccine. It has also signed deals with manufacturers in other countries, such as India. The final trials phase three looking to see the significant difference in numbers of deaths between those vaccinated and those who are not are taking place in six countries. Trials in the US 
Express, which was paused after a volunteer in the UK became ill, have resumed, and the other countries participating are South Africa, Brazil, Japan, and India. The vaccine is expected to be one of the first from the big pharma to secure the regulatory approval, along with one from Pfizer and BioNTech. Or BioNTech. Um, work bef- work uh, began on the co- Oxford vaccine in January called AZ1222 or CHADOX1. Um, COVID-19, the viral vector vaccine is made from a weakened version of the common cold virus that causes infections in chimpanzees. Stephen Evans, a professor of uh, pharma, pharma, how do you say that? Pharmacopedology in London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Amazing. And imagine going to London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. That's so cool. Cautioned that no conclusions about the efficacy the efficacy, so the vaccine should be drawn until the data has been published. He said, in order to comment properly on this, we need to see the data, he said. It is encouraging that the investigators suggest that the immune responses measured in the blood show, seem to show efficacy uh, both uh, above as well as below the age of 70. The later phases um, are needed to see if the immune responses translate into a clinical efficacy, efficacy, I'm not calling it efficacy, efficacy, right? In preventing infection, this will involve much larger numbers and it is wise to not be so optimistic until the trials have been completed. Raised antibody levels in the blood indicated but did not guarantee protection from the virus multiplying in the body, he said. So, encouraging signs. Again, <clears throat> I think we're going to see vaccines a lot sooner than a lot of these uh, medical professionals are basically um, saying, mostly because of the industries involved and the money at stake. I think sports and live events are going to do whatever is in their power to push the vaccine forward. Or if not, they're going to definitely be in a, they're definitely going to be within the field of um, rapid testing, which is happening quite often, especially for most sports per teams, right? The rapid testing where you're getting tested throughout the day at various points um, that you are basically going. If you're a team, you're trying to get on one bus, staying in one location, not intermingling with people outside the building, similar to what they did in the NBA with a bubble. So I can see that going forward, right? If you're a Coachella and you can't risk postponing your event again to 2022, you're going to then need to implement some kind of rapid testing to make um, the event somewhat safe if you don't have a vaccine on board. And that's the most that they can do. But again, the vaccine is for the majority of population to go. For myself, I'm not really bothered about the conspiratorial aspect of it. Um, I will much rather give away my so-called uh personal liberties or privacies momentarily to get a vaccine to return to normal life because i'm under the illusion i'm under no illusion that my privacy has already been invaded they have all the information they want on me i'm on every single social media platform or it was prior i don't have a facebook anymore but already that data is out there it's too late to take that back um the horse is already bolted there's no point now deciding this is where my line is drawn with this virus out there that's allowing me that's not allowing me to kind of go about my everyday life so i'm not really having that much of an issue with it in that regard but i'd love to know what you guys think regarding the vaccine one person who does have an issue with it is is the legendary the iconic and the somewhat controversial buju banton who had the this to say regarding vaccines <laughs> and the wearing of masks especially within jamaica hear him out but someone saw it and ask if everything all right i tell the brethren no everything now nah, all right and everything can all right who want done this mass wearing bullshit in a Jamaica? Who's the dead and who not go there just for just live? With either you intellectual fool trying to tell us how to live our lives. You are so smart, why you haven't found a cure for cancer? Good point. We are both all taught in a line and putting the Jamaican people in abject fear and driving us all to poverty. Exactly. What have you done for all those who you have laid off and made them business close early? Exactly. Jamaican people need to wake up. I'm done with the fuck, Craig. Jamaican people need to wake up. But now we're no mask. Come Me now wear no mask. mask. Me now wear no mask. I love it. And then let's next clip. <laughs> they taught you to love Michael Jackson. Then they taught you to hate Michael Jackson. True. They taught you to love Bill Cosby. Then they taught you to hate Bill Cosby. Uh huh. Don't you see that they have been lying to us for all these times? So Ooh. why should we believe them now? <laughs> why? How oh, ironic it is that this this virus actually is more intelligent than man. It's like it move and follow in certain individuals wherever they go. My pe- exactly. This virus doesn't it doesn't exist in, uh, in daytime, but it suddenly comes out in the night. If you leave the if you leave the pub just before ten, it doesn't catch you. If you leave after ten, hey! people, when they better wake up, the kind of go and find out. First and foremost, Jamaicans on a on a selling a vote, you know. And from on a selling a vote, you know, no sense. 
So anything can happen right now. Why <laughs> is up and stand up on the last chance of phone with the precipice? Ooh, why is up and stand up? <laughs> Top boy. <laughs> My love for you supersede all that this world has to offer. I will not join the other entertainers and trick you. I will not lead you down a path of destruction. I've always been sincere and true to you, my people. A lot of people are benefiting by touting and pushing my people down to a path that is totally destructive. Mm -hmm. Here in Jamaica, here in America, I don't care. My life is not mine. It has never been. So hear me, my people. While I'm here with you, stand up, you know. <laughs> I agree with him. Again, it's maybe somewhat woo-woo and conspiratorial, conspiratorial. But again... Much like something I'm going to speak about later with the clubs and stuff. There is a lack of acceptance of other people having other points of view and opinions regarding what's going on with COVID-19. It seems like um, some people have this hard time wrestling the fact that some people just view it differently. And they should be allowed to view it differently based on whatever conclusion they come to, based on the information points that they receive. Whether or not you think what they're receiving is nonsense, I think especially considering the bad job collectively the governments around the world have done in dealing with COVID-19, you are within your rights to be a bit sceptical about the approach and what's necessary and what's needed and, you know, some of the things that have happened in the kind of event and the backdrop of it and all these sort of things. You're allowed to kind of question these things. And I think the fact that we have these people that exist like Buju Benton and other folk, right? The pandemic guys out there who are, you know, again, batshit crazy. The QAnon people that are doing their thing, they're batshit crazy. It's it's all right that these people exist. Whether or not they should be, um, you know, main points of information dissemination is another question. But again, I would argue that it's probably just as harmful sitting there listening to everything Sky News say, CNN, MSBC, BBC, and taking everything they're saying for gospel. You should be... You should have some level of skepticism to everything that's been reported out there, especially considering the bad job most of the Western countries have done in dealing with COVID-19. That's just your right as a human being. You should allow yourself some level of skepticism because these people don't have your best interest at mind. They don't care about you and I. Most of the things are open, like, you know, why are we playing football right now? Why, again, for myself, being a good, you know, being a sports fan and an avid follower of Manchester United, I welcome the distraction of being able to watch um, Premier League football, Champions League football every week. But why is sports on at the moment? If the, why are they playing football if we can't go back to our offices? Why are they playing football if we can't go back to nightclubs? Why are they playing football if us as fans can't go back into the stadiums? Then you get to the bare bones of it and you actually analyse it a bit more. And you realise, ah, oh, look at the money that's involved. Look at the refunds that um, the English Premier League will have to give to the um, TV rights companies if, they don't, if they're not able to broadcast the games. So the short-term loss in terms of the um, failure for the teams to get gates tickets is being offset by some of the monies that they gain for the tv companies and then look at what they've done recently with the introduction of these pay-per-view games where you pay 14.99 to follow your team which is insane considering what most clubs what most supporters play for their season tickets and the you know the the kits have still been coming out like clockwork and um, some teams like my united for instance haven't been you know investing as heavily as they should be into the team but they're still requiring you to purchase new kits to watch them pay-per-view there's all these really sketchy things that are going on so i would be you would be um well within your rights to be a bit skeptical about uh people going around telling you when to wear a mask whether or not to take a vaccine if it's mandatory or not you should have your third eye open and maybe listen to a bit more budgie benton moving on moving on moving on oh we have this pretty interesting article via the New York Times analyzing some of the issues Anna Wintour is facing um, post George Floyd's death. Now, it's really odd, isn't it? You would have never imagined um, the death of a black man due to police brutality would somehow lead to these monumental shifts and changes within industries that far uh, supersede anything that's to do with, you know, um, social justice, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't really necessarily have thought that one person dying under the hands of the police in America would somehow lead to this push for diversity and inclusion and these really interesting conversations that are coming about. Now, some of the stuff is a bit wanky. Some of the stuff is a bit gross. Some of the stuff is a bit cringe. Some of the stuff is a bit victim, victim, victim me, woe is me, and a bit exploitative. But I do think the conversation around diversity is important. It's especially when it pertains to fashion. Um, there seems to be a bit of a, 
um, accepted ignorance um, and lack of understanding when it comes to what representation does do for fashion, right? This ability to dream and to see yourself in these clothes or certain brands having a very strong relationship um, to a certain demographic of people. I look at the early stuff that Dapper Down was doing with, you know, luxury fashion brands and those same fashion brands taking these his kind of ideas and essentially copying them or co-opting them onto the runway and reserving them back to a mostly white audience without the inclusion of the said people that made it so that's where those kind of conversations are really important because they allow for some recognition as to what these communities have done for these brands and allow some honest dialogue and participation between both people right um and I've all been for it. I hate the tokenization of it, right? Runways, hey, let's take the boxes and get five models from African descent, five models from Asian heritage and kind of get them on the runway. That's not my kind of diversity. Diversity in the actual places that matter, C-suite executives, decision makers, gatekeepers is really um, part of it. Because I think a lot of the people, especially on the influencer side of things, the street style side of things. If you speak to some of those people in, you know, in confidence, I'm sure they will admit their annoyance that kind of hitting a bit of a ceiling in terms of how far they can get in the industry, right? They're, these brands are okay with seeding product to people like Susie Bubble. But then when it comes to those kind of people having a seat at the table and being able to decide and, you know, uh, push a certain brand forward and play a, a real important part in maybe the overall vision of something, that's where suddenly they get pulled back and told, hey, this is, this isn't a meeting room for you. You need to go next door where you can go and pick out your dress that you're going to wear for London Fashion Week. So we need to have more inclusion included. We need to have a bit more of a conversation around inclusion, especially when it comes to the more important and prominent position in fashion behind the scenes. Anna Winter is one person who's kind of gotten unfairly, I guess, included in that. Now, unfairly, I'd say, because obviously she comes from a certain generation. Uh, she represents a certain, uh, she represents a certain vision of fashion, especially American fashion. But that isn't necessarily representative of what's going on. So for people to expect her to change um, um, or to adopt a different perspective is odd for people to expect her to, to step away and give them and give space to others is also odd because i think somebody who has committed that much of their life their entire adult life to fashion to a level that she has with the notoriety and the authority and the influence and the cachet and the clout whatever associated with her job is very um what would i say it's very naive to expect her to be happy to just step aside but some of the issues that are being pointed out regarding her tenure at, Louvre, at, at Vogue and what she represents um, is really alarming. And some of it is also quite funny because I don't see this as issues. I see this mostly as issues larger that is just larger outside of fashion. And I somewhat see it as a little bit... Um, out of order, a bit of a stretch. So this article is from the New York Times. It says the following, the white issue has Anna Winter's diversity push come too late. It says, Vogue September issue celebrated black culture and contributors, but some employees say the magazine's powerful editor fostered a workplace that sidelined women of color. And I would say it just, again, from my experience working in fashion, with you know, in some level, you know, a pretty low level for the most part, what I saw wasn't necessarily a sideline of people of color. It was just more so nepotism exists probably in all industries but i guess nepotism exists mostly or at the highest level in fashion right this idea that most of the people that have the positions that you would like or you kind of um, dream of getting usually have got those positions mostly based off of favor uh, or a connection from a friend it's all about networks all about who you know <coughs> Not all the time, of course, there's some people whose fashion, whose talent um, supersedes that and they can just burst through. But for the most part, it does help if you do have connections, do you have people that you know who are able to put you in certain rooms. And because, in my opinion, again, in my opinion, most of the entry-level positions in fashion, anyone could do them, especially if you have an interest and you have an obsession with that field, you could do most of these jobs. They would need to introduce some level of entry requirement because if not, you know, it's being possible to turn away most people because most applicants are um, um, have the necessary skills to do those jobs. So anyway, this article does a good job of explaining some of the issues at hand. Let me quickly read through some of these points. So um, it goes through here. What was the point I went to read through? There was one really interesting part. Yeah, this is the one, right? Where is it? Here. It's nothing here. Um. 
Yeah, so it's definitely the recent um, tumult, uh, tumult at Condé Nast has knocked Miss Winter off balance. Inspired by the protests that arose after the police killing of George Floyd in May, employees have confronted their bosses at company wide meetings and in smaller gatherings. Their complaints have led to the resignations of key editors and pledges from the chief executive Robert, Roger Lynch and Miss Winter herself to revamp Condé Nast's hiring practices. It continues I strongly believe that the most important thing any of us can do in our workplace is to provide opportunities for those who may not have had access to them undoubtedly i have made mistakes along the way and if any mistakes were made at vogue under my watch they they they're a mind to own and remedy and i'm committed to doing my work and of course the thing that stuck out to me was this they are mind to own and remedy and i'm committed to doing the work which is like you know her kind of rousing defiance and sort of reluctance to kind of step away and allow others to basically take the mantle and take that fight on and it kind of reminded me of this note that Tim Dillon, the stand-up comedian, made about Ellen DeGeneres and about her sort of like half-baked apology about some of her toxic workplace practices. And this reluctance in Hollywood and in most places of influence within set niches of culture, right? Whatever they may be. This reluctance of some of the people who have kind of ascended to the top of the of the mountain to just step away or to know when to leave the party. When the things have changed, when social when when social yeah when the politics have changed and the kind of overall tone that things have kind of moved on this defiance or this kind of insistence on just remaining that person at the head of the table is really odd especially when you consider the amount of people that are just sniping and sort of like trying to undermine your position behind the scenes it really isn't worth the hassle you'd assume Anna Winter has worked herself in a position where she has all the contacts needed for her to continue doing some work in fashion even she does step away from Vogue magazine or Vogue in general or Condé Nast under some guys but she still wants the prestige and the cachet of being you know Miss Vogue behind those shades sitting front row of the shows so she doesn't want to let go of that power and it's sad because you know inevitably what end up happening is that like most people if she doesn't she's not willing to step away um, on her own regard underneath her own watch or you know during her own decision she's going to be forced into some sort of resignation sooner rather than later um and again, the other thing too I thought was interesting was this point here about the hiring practices being quite, you know, white. And um, I'm someone that doesn't necessarily notice these kind of things. But one thing that stuck out to me a lot, especially something I've kind of never forgotten, was this one time, I don't know why, but I happened to be around central London, um, around, yeah, I happened to be standing right outside Vogue House, where the Vogue UK offices are. I'm not sure if they're still there now, but at the time they were. Um, and it was on the same day or at exactly the same time that there was a, you know, scheduled, uh, fire drill in that building. So everyone poured out onto the streets, right. That works in that building. And the first thing I noticed when everyone poured out was of course, oh, wow, there's loads of girls that work here. Some cute girls, blah, blah, blah. But I was like, wow, a lot of white people work at Vogue house, isn't it? Like a lot of people work at Vogue, like white, 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 like not even like spicy white, right? Like Nando's white, like proper, you know, Caucasian um, the whitest of the whitest, right? They could be flipping Boris Johnson's Boris Johnson's daughter's friend sort of white. Um, the people that, you know, where their parents go for Sunday brunch at Chiltern Firehouse white. And I was like, Jesus, that's interesting, isn't it? Especially considering um, London Fashion Week is known to be the most experimental, the most diverse, energetic, young, and just kind of, you know, there's a lot of energy around London Fashion Week. Energy that kind of, uh, represents the multicultural fabric of London of, as a whole. So you would assume, I don't know why, rightly or wrongly, that one of the most former, you know, four leading magazines in fashion, maybe not in terms of kind of representing, you know, the uh, creative class within the UK, people really pushing things uh, forward underground, but you'd assume there would be some level of representation of just what it means to be in fashion in London at the moment, right? But Vogue House was very opposite of that. It was just like, wow, this is a super white establishment. And that got me thinking about the lack of representation in fashion, just in general, the nepotism. Most of it, I'd assume there is element of uh, racial prejudice. I'd assume there is an element of racial discrimination in terms of hiring processes. But I think a lot of it has to do with just friends hiring friends. I'm sure there are a lot of people in there who don't have any credentials, who don't have the knowledge, who don't have the experience, getting positions that they probably shouldn't have, mostly based on the people that they know. And unfortunately, what ends up happening is that those same practices and those same approaches end up being co-opted and adopted by the people who are sort of like left out in the margin. So 
on both ends, from what I've seen, the really niche side of fashion in the industry, or you know, the kind of CSM graduate class of people, they're really clicky. And then the people on the other end who are super commercial, the Vogue, the L, the cosmopolitan sort of side of finger fashion, they're super clicky. So they both kind of copy the same practices again. Because if you're not able to get into Vogue House and get an internship at Vogue, the first thing you're going to do is set up your own magazine. And the first thing on your mind, even subconsciously, without you thinking about it, would be, I'm never going to let somebody like that who works at Vogue ever be in position to tell me what I can and cannot do. And that also might then go and affect who you hire because you might want to hire people that look like you more. So there's all this really odd stuff happening. So if anything, Vogue would probably be the best place to sort of rewrite some of those ills and kind of provide a bit of a neutral ground where you can kind of combine the best of both worlds. Because I still think there is a need to have that voice of the yummy mummy Notting Hill sort of crowd at Vogue. But there also is a need to have representative, you know, the kids coming out of fashion school at the moment who are trying to, you know, carve away in the industry, the sort of like one granary sort of crew. They also need to be represented in Vogue as well. So it's kind of twofold. It continues here, the article. It says, devoted a September issue, the most important of Vogue's year to black contributors indicates Miss Winter's grasp of intensity of the protest movement rolling royally in the country. But in fashion, of course, appearances are paramount. During a large colonist meeting in June, Miss Winter, who is the head of the company's Diversity and Inclusion Council, which is super lows that she's the head of Diversity and Inclusion, was compl- was conspicuously absent. Employees exchanged Slack and text messages during this session asking the same question, where's Anna? And that's a very good question. She didn't want the smoke. It makes sense. It continues. Long before Cotton S employees went public with complaints about the company's handling of race, Miss Winter has been criticized for Vogue's portrayal of black people. For many readers, a 2008 cover of LeBron James' G- Giselle Bunchen was reminiscent of racist images of black men from the century ago, which I think is unfair because at the time, you know, LeBron James wasn't as woke as he is now. But he, you know, willingly did this cover, which is, you know, it was problematic at the time I saw it and it's still problematic now looking at it. But you can't retroactively go back in time and tell people that what they... No, you can't retroactively go back in time and apply the same politics we have now to stuff that happened in the past. It is what it is. You move on and you learn your lesson. But, you know, again, a black man accept that position to do what he done there and pose like a flipping gorilla holding a basketball um, or holding onto a model and, a, and banting a basketball but again those things happen um it continues here the basketball star is bellowing and grippling the supermodel in the waist and some saw the unmistakable parallel to a racist world war one propaganda poster miss winter also drew criticism when she helped the fashion designer john galliano who was fired from christian Dior in 2011 after he was caught on camera making anti-semitic remarks and declaring i love hitler is a imagine how did this guy recover again I know how he recovered because I watch sports. If you're talented enough, people will make all the excuses under the book for you. It is what it is. But thinking about what we know now, especially viewing it through the lens that we are looking at life now at the moment, especially social justice and politics in general, it's insane that he actually survived that and he bounced back and essentially has never been bigger than what he was in the past, if anything, right? He's probably more well-regarded now than he was prior because he's gone through this quite, quote-unquote, human experience, right? It continues here. She continues to support Mr. Galliano even after he was found guilty of a hate crime at Paris Court. Again, if you watch sport long enough, you'll know that talented people, people that put the numbers on the scoreboard, whether it's sales, whether it's goals, whether it's trophies, they are all, they, the, the rules just don't apply to them. It's un- fair it's you know whatever it may be but it is what it is it's the world that we live in it continues being indisputably the most important magazine in fashion means vogue comes in for extra scrutiny especially in its cover selections last year the pudding a publisher of visual essays used algorithms to analyze 19 years of Vogue archives and measure the average lightness of the cover model skin tones in one span from 2000 to 2005 only three of the 81 women were black in a statement, Condé Nast said that um, from 2018 to 20, 30% of the Vogue covers featured black women. And again, that's a really nasty, tacky side of all this racial inclusion stuff and whatever it may be, right? First of all, the people criticizing it are looking at it from a purely ana- analytical point of view, right? Uh, ascribing diversity mostly through the prism of how much melanin do you have on your cover. The darker it is, the better, which again, is questionable, right? Considering that you're just going to be ticking boxes. Then when Vogue wants to reply and, and put a rebuttal out there, they will then pull out the stats and say, hey, we had 30%, 32% of our cover featured black women. 
which is then again them doing the same maths and deciding to go on the chart and make sure everybody that's on the cover occupies a certain level of blackness which again is super nasty all you want in fashion and in most things is for the people that buy your magazine for the people that wonder about the things that they could buy in that magazine for the people that work behind the scenes to be represented in the magazine that you're putting out there that's it whether they are racially ambiguous whether they are uh, whatever it may be varying levels of the socioeconomic you know graph or landscape that they kind of exist on you want yourself to be represented in the magazine in whatever point it may be and especially when it comes to women in magazine too like which are mostly aimed towards women you know identity and representation in fashion is a lot more than just race right it might be family relationships um mental health issues whatever it may be right there's other things that kind of um women would want to be represented by uh, outside of just purely what the person's skin tone is i would imagine it continues here. Former Vogue employee said in recent years, Miss Winter has not kept pace with the public changing attitudes on issues of racism and discrimination at London Fashion Week party hosted by Burberry in 2017. The reality star Kendall Gemma showed up with a new look, fake gold teeth. Vogue noted the choice in a breezy online story written by a white contributor. It said the flashing teeth felt like a pl playful wink to the city's free-spirited aesthetic or perhaps a proverbial kiss to her rumored boyfriend, Lisa Brocky. A black staff member uh, contacted one of the magazine's executives to object, saying the story's insensitivity um, endorsed the stance of cultural appropriation according to emails obtained by the New York Times. Other staff members uh, brought the article to Miss Winter's attention with one lieutenant explaining by email while some people on the staff um, on social media have reacted negatively. It says a quote, if Kendall wants to do something stupid, fine by our writers, especially the white ones, don't need to weigh in and glorify it to ascribe reasons to it and that read culturally insensitive. Um, and that's the picture, right? So that's nuts to begin with that somehow putting on gold teeth or fronts or grills and wearing hoop earrings is somehow um, akin to culture preparation is incredibly incredibly insane but hey it continues this winter appeared not to grasp the issue after several exchanges she wrote well i honestly don't think it's that big of a deal content i said in the statement the coverage itself is not culture appropriation so you see what's basically going on at vogue right there are changing shifts in consciousness and awareness and it looks like um Anna Winter is just not with the times and instead of just you know taking the honorable route out and deciding to call it a time and move on to do other things she's hanging on to dear life and will inevitably get pulled out kicking and streets kicking and screaming from the Vogue offices and it's a shame really right you would want people of her stature to decide when and when she decides to hang it up but unfortunately these people are so psychotic they're so entitled um whatever it may be that they think that they should they think that there are, there's no option, no possibility that they should, you know, essentially call it quits when they have the option to and just hang on to their job forever, especially when the customer base and the audience has necessarily changed underneath their nose. But again, what do I know? It's a long article. I'm not going to read the entire thing. It's on Vogue. Oh, so sorry, it's on New York Times. I'm going to put the link in the show notes. It's called The White Issue. Has Anna Wintel's Diversity Push Come Too Late? Moving on, what else do we have here? Ba, 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 we don't look at that. What's this? Nope, nope. What else do we want to talk about here? Let's move on to that one. Let's get away from there. Ba, ba, ba. Ooh, ooh. Okay, so um, another news piece here. We have this story regarding Quibi. Quibi is shutting down um, the short form video app that came out what i think somewhat six months ago somewhat right um there was loads of stories behind the scenes of them you know reaching out to various creatives to create um bespoke content blah 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 the idea behind it was that you'd watch all the video content via your smartphone or tablet um you couldn't necessarily stream it via tv or laptop so it kind of tried to pivot away from the general streaming services we have at the moment but unfortunately it didn't work and i have loads of things to say about this because of course as some of you know i have an extensive career experience working within um startups in the uk especially um some of the more 
crappier ones some of the ones that haven't necessarily worked out the best some of the ones with probably some of the worst founders i've ever worked for um but uh the experiences were very important in shaping the way that i look at startups and shaping the way that i look at things that i want to approach in terms of having my own business blah 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 loads of really good lessons to be learned from it so let's dive on deep with this uh story from the verge could be a shutting down it continues it says as follows sorry quibi the short from mobile focused streaming service is shutting down after just over six months of operation making it one of the short-lived streaming services to date according to the wall street journal the company has since confirmed that it will be shutting down in a medium post by jeffrey katzenberg and meg whitman a quote we feel that we've exhausted all our options. As a result, we have reluctantly come to this difficult decision to wind down the business, return the cash to our shareholders, and say goodbye to our colleagues with grace. The announcement reads, there is, any, there, there is any number of factors that can be pointed towards the unpacking of Quibi's demise, the launch of a mobile-only streaming service at the height of a global pandemic when users were stuck at home, the lack of any real breakout content that was compelling enough to tempt subscribers, or the fact that the short-form video content has nearly infinite amount of free competition in the form of youtube tiktok and other platforms now let's get break the first bit down i think it's honorable that they decided to go out on their shield right in a really honorable way they decided when it was time to pull to pull the plug they didn't wait for the cash to completely run out and then decide to pull the plug like most companies i've worked for they decided hey this isn't going as right as we can do let's in return the money to the shareholders give our staff members an, an opportunity to plan their next steps give them ample amount of time to you know go out and seek other career options and just give us time to kind of recalibrate where we are great credit to them and it definitely goes a long way to showing the kind of character the people behind were involved in founding quibi right good people but there's also a part of me that thinks especially from working in various startups that i'm pretty sure that there were people within the quibi offices who were kind of raising the alarm about maybe the misstep that they made in terms of how they approached the streaming platform because if i remember correctly there wasn't any there wasn't any real push towards putting out free content to kind of tempt the customers into signing up to quibi most of the stuff was behind the paywall there was no taster option there was no free option there was no sub um discounted subscribe discounted subscription rate for you to kind of join join for the you know let's say half the price for the first month and then for you to test it see if you like it and then kind of continue with that deal for the next six and then maybe ramp up to the standard price there wasn't none of that going on it was just mostly about hey this is a great app you're going to use it a lot it's behind a paywall pay the money and use the thing and then of course the other point of the kind of is real issue for them was that no matter how poor the app was i think part of the reason why it didn't succeed because it didn't have a standout hit show right they could have had a really clunky service you look at stuff like amazon prime the boys is a good example amazon prime video is a pretty horrible experience to use especially on your laptop more so on your smartphone but um the boys and some of their other original programming that they have on amazon prime video has done really well in spite of the actual ux or design of the actual site itself so that goes to show that if they would have invested a bit more money or no but if they would have kind of taken a little bit more care in the people that they invested in and not just kind of splashed the cash around to various production houses and studios and writers who essentially have now been paid for doing absolutely nothing i think they would have been in a far better place it continues um quibi itself is choking up um the lack of success because the idea itself wasn't strong enough to justify a standalone streaming service or because of our timing the company will be notifying current subscribers as the final date that they'll be able to access quibi and i think that again that's true i'm sure there is a part of me that thinks you could launch successfully a mobile only or a smartphone only streaming service during the pandemic because everyone's on their phone i would assume most people's screen time has gone up you know exponentially during uh, covid19 lockdown so i'm sure there's an option there's an avenue for somebody to start something like this and it to work but again i think the lack of that the lack of strength and depth in terms of the video streaming options they had available on their platform the lack of kind of interest outside of the people using quibi is what necessarily led to their downfall 
It continued to say it's not clear what will happen to the company's lineup of expensive star studded original shows and the short form films after the shutdown. Earlier reports indicated that Katzenberg had courted Apple, Warner Media, and Facebook to try and acquire their beleaguered streaming company earlier this year. When those efforts failed, Katzenberg reportedly tried to get Facebook and NBC um, Universal to pick up Quibi's content to no success. Quibi will continue to attempt to sell both the content and the underlying technology used in the apps in the coming months. However, Quibi launched on April the 6th, um, April the 6th, just over six months ago, um, with two plans, $4.99 with ads and $7.99 with no ad free. The company sought to distinguish itself by focusing exclusively on mobile devices at launch, complete with an innovative um, system where each show was filmed and edited in both portrait and landscape formats, allowing it to be viewed in any orientation. What a crappy option there. Anyway, um, there was no free option outside a lengthy free trial and no TV apps until yesterday. Um, when the company launched its apps for the app, Apple TV and Android TV and Fire TV. Again, look at the misses. So that's why sometimes I don't have a lot of sympathy for some of these companies because I'm sure some of these um, omissions and some of these oversights were things that people within the company had spoken about. But sometimes when you have really headstrong leaders who have a very specific idea of what the app should be like in their mind, especially if it's their own baby, it's very hard for you to kind of divert them away from it. They just look at it as a distraction and they just, you know, and there's there's this lionization around founders that stick to their plans and, you know, go for their goals. But it doesn't, it doesn't, those stories and those kind of, you know, lionized biographies don't take into account the people who kind of complemented or added to the success of the company who were kind of, you know, on the outskirts, right? the kind of entry level mid-level people who maybe threw a suggestion in there during all hands or during a company meeting that kind of added to the success or allowed the company to maybe seek some other avenues that would be a little bit more profitable so um again it's hard to have sympathy because i think a lot of these things were glaring omissions that i'm sure people within the company would have said something about during a meeting or two it continues that despite 1.75 billion uh Katzenberg and co-founder Meg Manning raised Jesus Christ 1.75 billion this is why sometimes I think to myself like I never understand why some of my friends can be really um can be really uh can lack confidence when it comes to applying for jobs or can lack confidence when it comes to applying for grants or loans and think that their idea their plan isn't worth um, the money that they're ascribing to it when their startups out here raising 1.75 billion for a video streaming app that only works on your smartphone right considering the amount of competition out there with free apps for video streaming considering the complete monopoly things like netflix and and youtube have on the video streaming platform for you to go out there and think that you have any opportunity to break um, that industry to somehow take away some of their market share is insane right but you know that is obviously the goal of most um, entrepreneurs out there, right? To do the things that no one else can do. So no faulting your ambition, but then to do it in such a clunky way, right? Especially raising that amount in such a clunky way with so many missing pieces to the app that weren't necessarily there, right? They said they only just launched the app for flipping Apple TV and Android TV recently. It definitely should give you confidence that whatever idea you have, whatever plan and goal and dream you have, you owe it to yourself to pursue it because there are people out there raising 1.75 billion for a video streaming app. What's main selling point is the fact that you can watch videos in both portrait and fucking landscape format. Who cares? What a crappy sell. So instead of them sort of pushing forward the fact that they have these really um thought-provoking seminal tv shows and movies that are really going to move the needle in culture they're boasting about the landscape and portrait formats of the videos god almighty god almighty um it continues um quibi burst onto the scene with more uh, of a whimper than a bang while it had plenty of big names attached to the content and even managed to game its way into the two emmy award wins it never seemed to manage to actually garner many pay subscribers which is the point right and again this goes to show that a lot of the i think of someone like a joe budden who people were made to he made to you know he's made to feel crazy for you know, rumoredly asking for 250 million from spotify but there is something to be said for being able to command 
for being able to put bums in seats and being able to attract an audience and take that audience with you no matter what platform you go on to. There is something to be said for it. And the fact that Joe Biden could actually say, I have the numbers that prove people signed up to Spotify to listen to my podcast only during these months or during this year or during this contract should go a long way in terms of kind of adding to the amount of zeros you put on his con you put onto his um, renewed uh, contract. It should go some long way because if people like this can raise 1.75 billion off a project Projections of how many uh, subscribers they're going to have on their platform and not actually hard numbers and actual users using the app day to day. Uh, I don't want anyone to feel less than. You should never be made to feel less than because these people out here are swindling cash like no business. And again, I'm happy they're giving back their money to investors because some of these companies, they do, they do this sort of like bait and switch where they go out there and raise money off the back of an idea that has no market validity or viability. I think whatever that word is, right? They go out and raise some money off the back of, a, of an app that has no market viability. They then uh, leverage that app to raise other loans. Um, they obviously show off their ability and talent to maybe take a company from zero to 100 employees, just have some shiny office in the middle of central London and then exit and have a, and then that company completely gets swallowed up by another company that then goes in and ends up kind of you know uh taking their talent and ship and chucking away everything else that's not really needed um but again god almighty 1.75 billion mad um a report from app tracking firm sensor tower back in july claimed that quibi lost over 90 percent of its subscribers after the initial three month trial ran out with just 72,000 of its roughly 910,000 users who had signed up at launch sticking around as paid subscribers quibi has refuted those numbers claiming that they were incorrect by order of magnitude but has never provided any actual subscriber accounts of its own which it shouldn't right it, you shouldn't be doing that but God Almighty, again, Quibi's out. Again, um, respect to the founders for putting their neck out there and trying to do something, right? And trying to add their sort of, um, try and leave their mark on the startup uh, timeline, right? Um, that's basically the dream of most entrepreneurs to go out there and leave some sort of indentation onto the world. But the app was pretty terrible. The idea wasn't that great. The market itself that they were trying to infiltrate is heavily, heavily crowded. Um, they didn't need, you know, they needed to come in there with a the bang. They came in with a whimper, grand opening, grand closing. Again, um, I'm glad they were able to give the employees a heads up, investors back their money and maybe kind of, you know, dust themselves down and go back again. But again, this is a cautionary tale for a lot of people out there, you know, especially employees and people that are trying to get involved in some of these startups. Vet them as well as you can. And for the founders out there, maybe follow Quibi's lead, isn't it? If it's not going well and it's kind of isn't necessarily living up to your expectations yep, that you're using, maybe do the honorable thing and pull the plug before it's pulled for you and give your employees and staff an option to go out there and seek other pastures new, innit? Um, the worst thing is being kind of held to ransom or being left in a state of purgatory, not knowing where you stand, leaders not wanting to lead, and then eventually it kind of affecting you the most as an employer as opposed to the founder. So again, credit to the guys for deciding to pull the plug when they did. But again, an another cautionary tale within the startup ecosystem. Moving on, moving on, deep. Okay, so over the weekend, it um there was a bit of an issue, a bit of but a bit of a a bit of a negative reaction concerning a party that took place in Berlin at Else. Else is one of the only venues open at the moment in Berlin. There's not a few. There's not a lot of them. Most of uh, I think most nightclubs are closed. Dancing is illegal. So the way that clubs and bars are getting around it is by hosting these open air parties that are essentially you know hosted in the courtyard, garden the area of a bar, um, socially distanced to some extent, but mostly based on the numbers that they allow in. The wearing of face covering and mask on the dance floor to prevent any transmission. But the obviously the as the kind of thinking behind it is that um the virus doesn't spread as easily in the outdoors as it does indoors so there is some kind of uh thinking behind it that makes some sort of sense right so um else has been running this whole series of open air festivals and open air parties during the entirety of summer 
And for the most part, they've gone away. They've gone out without a hitch. I think there's been a couple that people have been having some negative reactions to. But so far, there's been no real outcry online, especially within the people who are bashing the business techno people or who are sort of ascribing ill intent to these plague raves that are happening at the moment. And um, But it seems like the one that happened just this, this past weekend has garnered the worst reaction so far that I've seen online. So much so that um, somebody called Mikhaili, Mikhail, who's um, I think one of the people that was involved in Boiler Room back in the day, he was a host, one of the people that was involved in, you know, pushing back the crowd and they're getting a bit too aggy and, you know, pushing up on the DJ too much. He uploaded an image or a video, sorry, on Twitter, um, kind of displaying a very rowdy crowd going absolutely crazy to the sounds of Surikin, playing on that night along with some other DJs. And people online have kind of very, very negative reaction to it. So this is his tweet. He says, last night in Berlin, Els Club, by now it's clear that a lot of people just don't give a shit. Let's play a bit of sound. You obviously hear that fast, booming techno stuff that you hear people like Sarah King and Hector Oaks and what's her name? Clara Kuv and SPFF DJ. It's a sort of hipstery techno sound that's going on at the moment that everyone seems to love. I but for some reason, a lot of the people in the industry who are kind of against uh, maybe celebrity, I would say celebrity culture, I don't know what it is, but there is an, obviously a, a big dislike for some of these sounds and people involved in it. Maybe it's because of the people involved in it are dickers behind the scenes. I have no idea. I live in London, don't know these people personally. But from what I see, from that's looking, I think it's a bit undeserving. You look at some of the comments underneath. Um, da, 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 da. What he's saying here, so many people have been signing into my DMs, both with the accusations to be a class traitor and also pointing out that the current regulations allow the foregoing of minimum distance when outside. This is only, this is not, this is to my knowledge confirmed by multiple event producers, not a possible interpretation of the code, especially because the masses of sweaty ravers rubbing against each other is the exact opposite of the pr protective measures against the droplet infections. If someone has, however, an alternate interpretation they want to lay out or even a, whatever that word is, approved hygiene concept that allows that sweaty ravers in masks i apologize and shut up i doubt however that is someone will so of course there's a there's a camp of people who believe that no one should be raving under any circumstances during COVID 19 but there's also this aspect of an understanding there should be an understanding that the industry should be allowed to move on and to operate in some level uh, with some regulations especially when you consider the absolute bullshit job some most governments have done in terms of handling covid and obviously uh, uh, allowing for some sort of protection and support system for the places that are most vulnerable to the shutdowns and to the restrictions which are the bars and nightlife places um some of the other responses have been not as great it says neither the racism nor the corona will stop them dancing someone else says here i see it's outside they are wearing masks absolutely law-abiding what's your problem the police has got none and again what were you doing there side by outraging for clout stay home then he said the following outside in mass does not allow for circumvent the 1.5 distance rule and read the thread especially the part regarding the interpretation and potential of the current hygiene code not sure what you want from me though he says continues on here someone else says so what were you doing there the other day he said nice try but with the exception of the afternoon brunch and one social distance event i haven't left the house much due to the accident related immune deficiency um okay that's why he's so uh, triggered by it he says this video was pulled straight from one of the DJ's ig account the morning after so my point of view with it would be most of the stick that these people are getting especially sarah and a few others is mostly because people don't like them i guess with sarah it's easy to hate her because of some of the things that happened at the beginning of the lockdown which i'm not going to rehash it's not worth even getting into but most of it in my opinion was to do with people just being at home and frustrated and she was a bit of an easy target especially with some of the you know social faux pas that she might have put a foot in some things but of course musically i think there is also a bit of snobbery involved I would say snobbery. Is it cultural snobbery? I'm not sure what it is, but I do see a bit of a difference when videos come out online of people, DJs, performers, individuals in the scene who peep, who the kind of, yeah, there, there seems to be a different response when certain people host play graves and other people host play graves. When the tech house people host play graves, everyone comes out and bashes them, right? Because they're easy target. But then when people within their own little scene host playgrounds or do warehouse parties under the guise of some sort of, you know, 
fundraising event, no one has anything to say. So it does seem to be one rule for one and one rule for other, which I completely understand. If your friends are, you know, living on the breadline, they weren't necessarily touring DJs prior to COVID and they have to play a gig wearing a mask and a face shield somewhere just to keep the lights on. I understand why your expectation of them and expectation of an immediate lens will be different. But I think you should be viewing, you should be able to judge an immediate lens and your friend playing on NTS the same way. It shouldn't be judged any differently. That's my opinion personally. And then going forward with this, I also think there's aspects of it. Um, if the German government has allowed for some places or the Berlin government allowed for some places to function as an open air venue, especially when else, they have this really amazing article that I recommend people check out that was uh, put up there by a resident advisor. Some would argue it was propaganda, but from what I read, it was a pretty honest take um, as to how it how else is functioning during you know COVID-19 and what they're doing in order to make it as safe as possible. It's called Perspectives from the Scene featuring Sebastian Voigt, the booker at Else. And it goes into some detail as to what goes into making sure that they put on a very successful event at the club itself. And I really recommend most people checking it out because it does seem like the people involved in putting that party together really care about the scene and are trying their best to provide a safe as they can platform and place for people to go to number one, the ravers to kind of go and, you know, let their let their hair down and have a bit of a dance and of course providing opportunity for the DJs themselves to play I'm sure you're not going to find most DJs who are playing on else complaining about being booked on a Sunday to play a daytime rave somewhere and put some money in their pocket they have no complaints the people actually attending the rave who are able to kind of leave their apartments for you know most of the day between the hours of 2 and 10 p.m have a bit of a dance and a drink with their friends won't be complaining either it's the ones on the outside who are fundamentally against anybody you know going outside and returning to some level of normality with this virus still in circulation who have the most to say about it which is understandable too you look at this mckaylee guy um who says he has some you know um health reasons that are preventing him from going outdoors in the first place so he's a little bit more conscious and aware and sensitive to what's going on but i don't think that prism or that idea or that pov should be applied to others Again, we're in 2020, we're approaching 2021. Most governments have dealt with COVID you know, haphazardly in a very reckless and somewhat off hand, especially in the UK, right? Very hands offish type of way. And, you know, so much so that there's rumors of a tier four being introduced here in the UK. Um, parts of Spain have gone under lockdown. Italy has enforced the enforced curfew again. There's so many really bad ways of approaching COVID-19 that I don't, that I somehow understand why certain industries, certain establishments, certain business owners are taking matters into their own hands. And I get it. Do I support it fully? Would I want to put myself at risk and go to these events? Probably not. But I understand why some people would want to do so. And I guess it's unfair to not, it's unfair to ascribe your way of looking at things and how you would want to operate to everybody else. I think if you make the decision to stay indoors and you're happy to do so, do it. The people that want to go out and rave, let them do so. If they put themselves at risk, it is what it is. I don't think they're doing any different. They're not causing any much damage to anybody else going to a bar, going to a restaurant or going to a supermarket at this point in time. I don't believe those numbers or those facts to be true. But hey, what do I know? Moving on, we have this really, <laughs> we have this really, really funny uh, clip here from, again, another example of uh, the maybe the the dams are bursting at the seams and people are having enough of COVID-19 lockdowns and people are sort of rebelling. This is really funny video of a, a rave that took place in the UK over the weekend featuring Wave, uh, Michael Bibby and Archie Hamilton. Again, the business techno cruise uh, or tech house cruise, so it's harder, it's easier to basically point your fingers and laugh at them and sort of like get angry and have a negative reaction to what they're doing the video itself is jokes because again it kind of you know there's no amount of money that would you you would pay me to go to a party like this especially during covid the last thing i want to listen to to break my sort of like uh going out uh you know yeah, to, 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 the last thing I'd want to do to kind of break my going out duct was to go to a tech house party. But hey, look, look, look at this. You can just smell the cat in the air, innit? For me, I, this is not worth to break quarantine for, but the smiles on the faces, the joy, the, you know, the acceptance for the rule breaking. It, it's, it, 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 it somehow warms my spirit somewhat. Oh. 
video behind the booth for people playing loads of loads of overuse of filters hands in the air dilated pupils cat spoons you know the vibes Come to drop. Drop, drop, drop. And just looking at that, it's making it's making me get goosebumps, man. There's nothing like going out, is there? So I get it. But again, the reaction has been somewhat negative. And this response underneath made me burst out laughing. So Business Techno went and uploaded some tweets, screenshots of people that were at the event and um, lending some of their uh, views as to what went down. Now, of course, the issue at hand is obviously the fact that this crowd of people, especially the tech house scene, they're very social they're very social media native right uh, social media has been a very integral part in kind of boosting a lot of their profiles allowing them to wide, reach a wider audience making people go from you know uh weekend pub dj goer to a festival act in no time they really use social media really well it can get a bit cheesy and really corny but i respect it but there's also an aspect of them you know so addicted to kind of showing off that they're playing in places that it kind of was counterintuitive that they would allow people to take videos at an event that shouldn't be happening at an event that's essentially illegal that's essentially what kind of fucked them over in that respect and um some of these accounts are super jokes because it goes to show just why some of this stuff could be problematic so business techno put up a screenshot of some people that have attended look at some of the responses of what was going down one this this girl Demi Murphy says I've seen some weird things last night, but seeing Richie Ahmed do a line of somebody's actual bald head made my actual head fall off. <laughs> and it's funny as well when you consider the legend of Richie Ahmed is that supposedly allegedly he was what the connect or the dealer of that whole crew of people that were coming up, right? The Jamie Joneses. I forgot what that, what, what that label was at the at the at the heyday during like the late. 2005 2008 period and then he kind of just started practicing playing in one of their homes and then suddenly turned into a touring dj in it overnight but he came into the game being the sort of connect right the guy that was lacing everybody with ketamine or something allegedly that's what i've heard throughout the scene so hearing that is jokes and you know again it goes to show just why some people think some of these events should be happening because once they do get an opportunity to put on a part instead of being somewhat um somewhat careful about the things that they're doing and kind of maybe avoiding some of these um you know obvious acts of debauchery they go they lean right back into these things and this kind of maybe is a, a, an indicator of what they actually miss out of going out is more so the copious amounts of drug taking as opposed to the actual music and whatever it may be but hey who, who's to judge we continue on another screenshot it says here, Archie Hamilton and wife last night was super stuff. Yeah, another girl says getting so jealousy in people's tweets. Um, another one said I went from fine dining to wife B to B Archie warehouse bits real quick. As if an Archie turned up, that was a warehouse rave last night. Wife and Archie did there. Cannot get over how good the rave was. Fuck me, that was needed. God bless wife and Archie Hamilton. I don't know how they put that thing on in London warehouse. Big up them. And she says, it's, uh, Alicia says, um, these illegal raves are looking sick, but bringing everyone back together. But if you do, please remember to protect the artists and and, and are playing and the videos you post online. I've seen loads. Okay, cool. Uh, some tweet here says the following: seen loads of shit being dished out on social to those who played by the bedwetters. <laughs> I love that term, bedwetters. I think there should be no camera phone rule because people can't be trusted not to post footage online, and the rap bastards are tagging in the axe and the Met Police asking them to respond. Which is yeah, that's a scummy part. I think if people want to go out and rave and you're against it just be against it going out there and ratting people in fobbing them into police is some nonsense behavior there's no need to do so um whatever karmic whatever virus karmic energy is meant to do to come to them will come to them in some way shape or form we don't need you adding to it that's my opinion that one 
Another screenshot, it says, Solado point us in the direction of the next illegal rave. That one last night looked proper. So everyone's basically had enough, it seems like, but all intense purposes, people want to go out there and rave. And I think we're going to see a lot more of these things happening in the next few weeks, personally. I don't think this is, this is, de this is definitely not the end of this matter. I, I definitely see more places deciding or more people deciding that they've had enough and they want to go out there and kind of throw their hands in the air and get a bit crazy because, you know, COVID-19 is not going to take over most people's lives, I think, in the most regard of it. But hey, what do I know? Um, yeah, uh, da, 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 da. I think that might be it, you know. Yeah, I think that might be it. Let me end it there. That is episode number 393. We're over an hour and 20 minutes in. Don't want to waste too much more of your time. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Excellent Zing Show, episode number 393. As always, if it's your first time listening, make sure you smash that like, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. And if you're listening via the podcast, that please do me a five star review and share the show with your friends. Um, of course, I'll be back again for an episode of the show, so definitely wait for that one to be available very, very soon. But until then, take care, be safe, and I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Bye.